in the house of the Lord again. Have our first Sunday night service. I'm glad to be in the house of the Lord. The Bible says in Psalms 100, to make a joyful noise unto the Lord all ye lands, to serve the Lord with gladness, and to come before his presence with singing. Know ye that the Lord, he is God. It is he that hath made us, and not we ourselves. We are his people. We're the sheep of his pasture. We're to enter into his gates. We're to enter into the house of the Lord with thanksgiving. We're to come into this place with praise. Because the Lord is good and his mercy is everlasting and his truth endureth forever to all generations. So you're here tonight. Let's praise the Lord with everything that we've got. And let's just invite him into this place and know that he is going to have a great move. There will be a breakthrough in this house tonight. Deliverance, 
Can we all clap our hands tonight? Jesus, we love you, Lord. We thank you, Jesus. God, you're so mighty and so strong, Lord. There's nobody like you, Lord. God, we worship you, Jesus. We worship you, Jesus. Uh, God, oh God, oh God, oh God, we love you tonight, Lord. Bless your name, Jesus. Praise God. We're going to go before the Lord in prayer tonight, and we are so glad that you've chosen to be with us. Amen. On this Sunday evening. Amen. And we know that God is doing great things. A few requests that we need to pray for. Please pray for Sister Luella Ansel. Uh, Sister Luella is at Genesis right now. She's supposed to be taken to Riverside Hospital at some point. And uh, they're looking at narrowing of some arteries somewhere. And so we want to keep her in our prayers. We want to pray for Brother and Sister Adams. They called earlier, and both of them are not feeling well. Brother Ron Kelly is not feeling well either. And so please keep him in your prayers. Brother Potts, the Lord would touch his body. It was good to see him here this morning. And we're just asking that God continue to touch him. Uh, then please pray for Rhonda Cravener. She's having trouble trouble with her, her feet, I believe. And then Brother John Amore, he is in the hospital as well, and he has a wound that will not heal. And so if you have a need that you'd just like to make known by the lifting of your hand right now, you know, God knows each and every one of these requests. 
Amen. Why don't you hold up that hand just a little bit longer. Take a look around the room. Maybe find two or three uh, that you would uh, just like to focus on in prayer. Amen. I, I, know, I know a God that can heal. How about you? Amen. Why don't we take these needs to the Lord right now in prayer? Dear Jesus, we call on you right now, Lord. We thank you, God, for your great and glorious uh, word. We thank you for your great power, Lord. And we're asking you, Jesus, that you would touch in each and every heart, in each and every body, God. You see, Sister Luella, God. Oh, Lord God, we make this a point of prayer, God, to call on you for her, Lord. We pray, God, that you would touch in her life, Lord. We pray for Brother and Sister Adams. We pray for Brother Kelly, God, that you touch his body, Lord. We pray, God, for Brother Potts, Lord, for Sister Cravener, Lord God. And we pray, Jesus, that you would touch, Lord, and move in Brother John's life, God. And you see every need, Lord, that was represented in this house, God. Lord, we, we call on you right now. We believe in the power of prayer, Lord. God, we hear the the Spirit's call, Lord. Jesus, that you would touch each and every one of these needs, oh God. Lord, you are the mighty God, Lord, that saves. You are the wonder of wonders, Lord. God, you see every touch, Lord, that needs to be made. Oh God, I pray it right now in the name of the Lord. God, you see all the people, Lord, that have suffered with this COVID-19. God, we pray, Lord, that you would heal their bodies, God. We pray, Jesus, that you, Lord Jesus, would just touch them. God, in your mighty name, we pray, Lord, for that you would move, oh God, across all of the injustice, Lord, that's going on around our country and around the world. Lord, we pray, Jesus, that you would have your mighty, mighty way. Oh God, God, turn back, Lord Jesus. Lord, the evil that would like to overtake us. And God, allow your will, Lord, to be settled in our hearts and our minds, God. We pray it in Jesus' name, in Jesus' name, in Jesus' name. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Let's give him another hand a praise tonight Lord we thank you we thank you Jesus for your great touch Lord and God we just glorify your name Lord in Jesus name amen won't you turn around and just greet somebody wave at somebody praise the Lord amen God bless you give it a wave maybe this side could wave at that side you guys in the middle two guys you can you can wave on both sides. Hallelujah. I don't know why there's only two here, but hey, <laughs> it is what it is. Praise God. Hallelujah. We're so glad that you've come to be with us tonight. You may be seated just for a moment. Praise God. And uh, this week we were promoting our Save Our Children offering. This is an offering that we receive to bless children all over the world. And uh, uh, it's used for uh, crusades. Uh, there was a one of my friends, Brother Keith Blaylock, he, he made a trip down, I believe it was to Guatemala this last year, and he was able to be there as a part of an orphanage and a part of an outreach that was there. And they are able to minister to literally hundreds of children that are in great need. And so part of these monies go to this. Part of it goes towards camp meetings, camps that children can have, that they can get together and they can grow and they can make lasting memories. We have to have lasting memories around the things that are important to us. You know, if it's, if it's just something that's not wholesome, you know, we can go and do anything that we want to do. But, but children, they need to be guided and directed in, in wholesome ways, ways that are protective for them. We don't ever want one of our little fellows to be hurt, to be abused. Amen. We, we love them so much, and we're so thankful for them. Amen. And so if you'd like to give to that, you can. You can mark that on your envelope, um, and uh, we'll make sure that that gets to the right spot. Praise God. But we do believe in it. We know that God, amen, uh, rewards. And so we're asking a couple of ushers to come right now. Um, that's fine. Come on. We've got plates back there. And I, I know it's, uh, we're, we're concerned about social distancing, uh, certainly because of the times that we're living in. There will come a day when this will be behind us. Uh, amen? There will come a day when this is behind us. And so we just pr uh, ask you to please honor and respect uh, all of those that are. So if you wouldn't mind coming to the front, we're going to pray. And then we'll just uh, we'll have you go out. We're not going to have everybody march forward, but we'll have... Uh, you go out. So, Lord Jesus, we're thankful tonight for your goodness and your mercy, Lord. We're thankful, Lord, for your great touch. We pray, Jesus, that you would bless in each and every way. In Jesus' name, 
before you start, I will just say to those that are online and literally anybody that wants to give, you can go to our website at uh, www.thelifewaychurch.org. It is O-R-G at the end. And you can see e-giving on there. You can give uh, to Save Our Children. You can give to the church, uh, whatever you want to do. But we recognize that giving is a very important part of worship, and we love to give. So praise uh, folks are going to sing again. Let's enjoy giving. God bless you men as you go and, and uh, receive the offering today. Oh, 
time. Thank you, Jesus. Lord, we love you tonight, Lord. We love you tonight. Come on, let's worship the Lord just a little bit longer. Lord, we praise you tonight, Jesus. God, you're a mighty God. You're a wonderful Savior, Lord. Lord, we love you, Jesus. You come to save us, Lord. You come to give us eternal life, Lord. God, we're thankful for that tonight, Jesus. We're thankful for that. Hallelujah. Praise God. Praise God. Praise God. Praise God. Amen. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Don't you love the Lord tonight? Amen. What a great honor it is to, to be with you and to, for you to be in the house of the Lord. And uh, we just want to, it's awesome to see Debbie back with us tonight. She's going to be baptized in Jesus' name. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. She brought her family with her tonight. Brought her husband, Russ, great cook. She's a good cook, too. Amen. But uh, we're so glad that here brought her family and granddaughter. And just, we're just so glad that they're here. It's good to see Sister Kyla in the house of the Lord. First time she's been able to be here. Her job is such that uh, she's not able to make it except on Sunday nights. And so uh, I don't know if it was a mad dash to get here, but we're glad you're here. Amen. And uh, it's good to see each of you in the house of the Lord. And so we're just going to get right into the word of the Lord tonight. Uh, we won't make you aware that Tuesday night uh, for, uh, how do you say it? Lifeway Kids Live. I'll get that right here in a little bit. Uh, they're going to be taking a break, and on Tuesday night at 7 o'clock, the children can tune in, or their guardian, their adult in their life can tune in. Uh, I'm going to be uh, sharing a couple of uh, illustrated uh, things that I believe God gave me to minister to children. And like I said earlier, children need wholesome things to watch. And uh, maybe you'll remember a few years ago, Don the Donkey. Well, Don the Donkey is going to come back and visit us. And uh, we'll tell the first story uh, this week. And then the second story next week, next week's story will be a brand new one. This week's will probably be new to a lot of people. But I, I just want want you to encourage your children if you know any children that would enjoy these kinds of things please please turn them on to this you can just go to our our uh, facebook page uh, lifeway lifeway church zanesville and you can see all of those things there uh, all of the services are online there and you can see those we're thankful for all of those that are tuning in online to be with us tonight and uh, we're just so excited we want to get to the baptism tonight and uh uh, we're thankful for that. Uh, I, I tell Jonathan every once in a while, I've been waiting for you my whole life. I've been waiting for this day. And you know what? That's the way it is with Jesus. Lord, when I found the Lord, it's been a long time ago now. I was 10 years old, and it's almost, well, we're at 45 and a half years. And uh, God knows what is tomorrow. It will be 45 and a half years still. 
because <laughs> it was January the 5th, amen, 1975, when I received the Holy Ghost for the very first time. And uh, I have just made it a point, amen, to keep God in my life, and I'm thankful for His blessings. I'm going to direct your attention tonight to the book of John, John's Gospel, chapter number 4. And uh, in light of, I'm going to address some things tonight, and I don't, please do not misconstrue what I am saying that and I am not about to turn this into a political arena, but I do believe that there are some injustices that have been made, and uh, I, I do, I do, do uh, support uh, the, the communities that are less fortunate that have been abused, that have been held back. Uh, Tonight's message I am going to entitle, The Mission Makes the Difference. And uh, we're going to start reading in John chapter 4, verse number 1. And again, thank you for honoring us with your presence here tonight. It says, When therefore the Lord knew how the Pharisees had heard that Jesus made and baptized more disciples than John, though Jesus himself baptized not, But his disciples, he left Judea and departed again into Galilee. Verse 4 says, and he must needs go through Samaria. And cometh he to a city of Samaria, which is called Sychar, near the parcel of ground that Jacob gave to his son Joseph. Now Jacob's well was there, and Jesus therefore being wearied with his journey, sat thus on the well. And it was about the sixth hour. The story goes on to talk about a woman of Samaria that came to draw water. Jesus said unto her, give me to drink. You'd think it would be the other way, or other way around. She would ask the gentleman. But no, Jesus asked her. For his disciples were gone away unto the city to buy meat. Then saith the woman, the woman of Samaria unto him, how is it that thou, being a Jew, being a Jew. So we notice that there are some some situations going on here. Ask us drink of me, which am a woman of Samaria. For the Jews have no dealings with the Samaritans. And Jesus answered and said unto her, and this is critical, folks, if thou knewest the gift of God, and who it is that saith unto thee, give me to drink, you would have asked of him or me, and he would have given you living water. Amen. The woman saith unto him, Sir, thou hast nothing to draw with, and the well is deep. From whence then hast thou that living water? Art thou greater than our father Jacob, which gave us this well, and drank thereof himself and his children and his cattle? And Jesus answered and said unto her, Whosoever drinketh of this water shall thirst again. But whosoever drinketh of the water that I shall give him shall never thirst. But the water that I shall give him shall be in him. Everybody say in me. In him, a well of water springing up into everlasting life. And the woman saith unto him, Sir, give me this water that I thirst not, neither come hither to draw. And Jesus saith unto her, Go and call thy husband and come hither. Amen. And we'll leave off reading there. The story's a little long. We'll talk about it. But I want to preach to you again, as I said, the mission makes the difference. Would you pray with me right now? God, we're asking you, Lord, by your holy name, Lord, that your anointing would come into this room, into this place, into this soul, into this spirit. I pray, God, that you would touch every heart, Lord, that is hearing my voice tonight or that will hear my voice in the days to come. I pray, Jesus, that there would be a clarion call, Lord, that there would be clarity, and Lord Jesus, that there would be resolve in people's hearts to understand, O God, that you are Jehovah Sidkenu, you are our righteousness. And Lord, I pray, God, tonight in this place, touch every heart, every heart, every life. And God, allow your word to have free course in Jesus' name. And everybody said amen. God bless you. You can be seated. John foretells a story of Jesus' trip through Samaria. It is one that is very familiar to most of us. In case it's not, we will review it in some detail. Volumes have been written concerning the territory. It was a territory the Jews were not really fond of. 
For you see, the Samaritan's lineage dates all the way back to the division of the kingdom, all the way back to uh, King Jeroboam and King Rehoboam. And it, it goes to the point to where people, when there was a harsh king, Rehoboam d- had said that he would be more harsh than his father was. And so we see that harshness is something that sometimes can be bound up in the heart of people to bring us to places that we really don't want to go. And I, tonight, I, I believe that love is more powerful than hate. I believe that invitation is more powerful, amen, than the rule that people can bring upon us. I, I believe it's important that we understand a little of the background because of the Samaritans, as they were known, were the group that separated from the kingdom of Israel and they decided to go a different way and not to follow uh, what uh, s- the king Nehemiah had, or excuse me, Rehoboam, ne- Rehoboam had set in order. And so King Jeroboam came along and he introduced a new kingdom. He introduced a, a, a new way of living and a path of uh, least resistance. The, the historian, Jewish historian Josephus, wrote this, that when the Jews were in prosperity, the Samaritans claimed kindred to them. You can read that in Ezra 4. But when the Jews were in distress, they were Medes and they were Persians. Amen. At a later point. And again, you can read about that in Josephus, his antiquity writings and the history of the Jews. The important thing is this. When you're looking for a friend, you're not looking for a fair weather friend. Is that right? But you're looking for somebody that will be there when, when, when the going gets tough. And, and, and that's important that we have people with us that are on your side when, when things are hard. And it's good to have family. I, I love family because family, you know, it's almost as if they have to love you in, in spite of, of whatever you may do and whatever you may bring upon yourself sometimes. But this type of behavior brought upon them this sort of two-faced attitude. It brought upon them a, a disdain among many people. And they were, they were considered by many people of that day to be a, a mongrel race. They were put down like many feel today. They were dismissed as people that were not to be respected. And folks, I've got a problem with that. These people were judged because of the behavior, not because of the color of their skin, but because of how they acted. In time, this grew into just a, a seemed to be an association, a, a, a longing to hate somebody just for the cause of hate. Now, when we move on, this chapter begins with mention of Jesus' ministry and the growth that he is involved in. You read the the Bible, you'll find out that Jesus' ministry was growing by leaps and bounds. And we read there in verse number one where it spoke about uh, that uh, the Pharisees heard that Jesus made and baptized more disciples than John, and that would be John the Baptist. And Jesus didn't baptize one person. That was all done by his disciples, you see. But he left that growing population, that growing following, because, you see, Jesus was never, uh, he was never impressed by crowds. Jesus was not impressed by crowds. You see, Jesus in heaven has millions upon mil- millions, multiplied millions of angels that worship him every day. And so a crowd of people, it's not like with people today that, that seek a crowd and seek the roar of the crowd. That's not what Jesus is interested in. But Jesus is interested in 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 people and in well i said it earlier in righteousness and so as we look at the beginning of this chapter and we see all of this great thing going you know once you get a good thing going uh, most people would say let's keep it going you know let's you get a fire going and it's cold outside you get a you get a fire going and you're on the outside and you just want to keep it going and so you just keep feeding uh, the fuel to the fire you'll you'll get it going and you want to keep it going because you want to stay 
lukewarm. Well, in this situation, as I mentioned, Jesus didn't care about the numbers. He didn't care about the crowd. But he was, he was interested in something else. And then there's an odd statement that is mentioned in verse number 4. And it says this, And he must needs go through Samaria. In one breath, there is a comment of Jesus' ministry growing by leaps and bounds. And then in the next breath, he leaves a revival in the crowds and he departs into obscure parts of Galilee, in particular to a city called Sychar in Samaria. Now, I just want to say this. The wording is challenging in this because we've got to understand something here. The Bible says that he must needs go through. Everybody say through. He must needs go through through Samaria. So what that means and what he's saying is it's not really a stopping place. Samaria and Sychar was not to be a stopping place. This was to be a place where he would go through to get somebody, get somewhere else. But when you read that through, the, 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 the denotation is that there is something that he has to get through. Now, a lot of the things that we, when we think of uh, geography, you know, you got to well, you don't have to, but most people, when they're trying to get to Indianapolis, they go through Columbus. But I would say this here, that to if someone, and Sister Tammy was here this morning, and she has been going through cancer treatment, for her to come out to the other side and, and to, to receive at least what the doctors to be the best a protocol for her treatment, that she must go through chemotherapy, and she must go through low dose radiation to bring her to the other side to where they believe that they can provide to her the best treatment for what she's going through. And so sometimes through doesn't mean going through a place, but it means going through situations, going through areas. And so when we see what's going on here, there is something about this situation. Jesus is not trying to go through Samaria, but he's trying to fulfill a purpose. That's important that you understand that tonight before we can go in any farther in what I'm talking about. Because I'm not preaching this message as, as maybe you've heard it so many times before, but I, I believe that Jesus had a purpose there. I mentioned earlier that he is Jehovah Sidkenu. He is the, the God of righteousness. Everybody say righteousness. And righteousness means doing the right thing. Now, some people may clarify what that means according to their position in a political party. I, I'm, God doesn't play that guy, game. What is right is right. And injustice can be done. Uh, is it the gentleman George, George Floyd here, uh, it's been now, what, a couple, almost a couple weeks ago now that he went through uh, one of the most terrible ordeals that, that a man, a person, anybody could go through, a dog, an animal, anybody could go through to, to be subdued and then to have your neck uh, held to the ground and literally be, be crying out for any kind of deliverance, uh, amen, even back to the, the, the very primal need of one's mother, and this man even died there on the spot. And there are charges that are pending against these officers. And, and I believe that the one is at least now been uh, brought up to second degree murder. And in everything that we can see, uh, I, I'm not sure how that a, a, a jury and someone could not come to that position. And, and, but I'm not on the jury. It's not my job to listen to the evidence. It's not my job to preside as judge uh, over, the, over the proceedings. But, but just uh, from the point of view that we are able to see it at so much, it, it, it certainly appears that way. But Jesus was on his way, and uh, thinking more about, about, just a little bit more about George Floyd before you go on, the man was not treated righteously. If he'd done something wrong, and I heard that he was trying to pass a $20 bill, okay, if you're trying to pass a $20 bill, then arrest the man for, for counterfeiting and, and spreading counterfeit bills. I, I don't know what it was, and if that was a true or not, I don't know. But here's what I will say, doesn't matter what the man did, he didn't deserve what he got, Justice was not served, amen, and I, I want to go on record as saying that tonight, and I, I am not, I don't want to speak uh, from a position of uh, 
criticizing all police officers because I believe that we have many good police officers, people that protect us every day. But to those that would stand up and take the law into their own hands, I've got a problem with that. Because a man that will take the law into his hand one time, he will take it into his own hands another time. And it just depends on which side of his business that you're on, whether that would go through. But I want to let you know, God is not that way. God is always righteous. God always does the right thing. And sometimes doing the right thing, it'll cost you something. Hello, can I get a witness today? The text continues providing background information. I, I want you to know that when you start reading here, you get past verse number four. You're going to start reading some things. It says that when he came to the city of Samaria, which is called Sychar, near the parcel of ground that Jacob gave to his son Joseph. Now, now you're getting new information. I don't know if you realize this or not. You've probably read it so many times, but you will never have read that in your Bible in the Old Testament. You don't read that. It's not there. Um, when you go on and read a little bit farther, it, it goes on to say that Jacob's well was there. And Jesus, therefore being wearied with his journey, sat thus on the well, and it was about the sixth hour. I was read summoning, reading some of the theologians that speak about this, and they wondered at why that this was not mentioned in the Bible. And, and as I was praying and considering what God was dealing with me, uh, I... It just came to me so hard. This was the parcel of ground, a little town that was given to Joseph by Jacob, his father, as a gift. It even states that, that Jacob's well was there. Now, this is really odd language. Jesus makes a journey into an unknown place that he is not even planning on stopping in, apparently. And he is planning on getting through this place. Now, hang with me just a little bit. There, there's this debate that's going on about Jesus' trip into the city. Some people would say that he just went there for the woman to reach this, this woman that was of ill repute. She didn't have a very good reputation. But I, I believe that it was much more important of a trip. And the woman being there, and now I will say this, that anything that Jesus does is not by accident, but I believe that it was planned as well because it went along with the purpose that he was there for. Okay? Now, I want you to know that most Jews would not even travel through that area called Samaria. They would travel the extra four days just to walk around it because they didn't consider the Samaritans important enough to even walk through. So why would Jesus make a special trip into this little God-forsaken place that nobody even knows about or wants to know about? But I want you to know with God, there's always a reason. You can believe that. Why we're here tonight, I don't know the full purpose and meaning of everything that's going on tonight, why, we, why this COVID-19 has come up, but I do know that God has a reason, praise the Lord. Whenever you see God ask a question in the Bible, it is never for information, but he is directing his disciples to consider a deeper meaning. The same needs to be considered in this instance. Why would Jesus go to a city that he says is going, that he is going to go through? Now I want us to just think a minute. Could it be that there is a deeper revelation for us to consider than merely just the woman, merely that she is a woman that's been pushed aside, merely that it's more than just uh, a, a people that have been, cons been considered a mongrel uh, people and that have been uh, discriminated against and put down. I, I believe that there's something deeper that, it, that there is there. Could it be that nobody ever knew this was Jesus' place? I'm sorry, Joseph's place. Because I want you to think about something. Because it was gr the ground given to Joseph after he was considered dead by his father. Could it be that this was the place? You see, everyone was supposed to get, get their, their plot of ground. But you know what? When it came to Joseph, Joseph was stolen away by his brothers. They were, he was sold into slavery by his brothers. And while they were all enjoying you know, their father as they grew older, here is Joseph. And where is Joseph? This was the ground. Could it be that this is the place that jo excuse me, Jacob mourned for Joseph during the years he thought Joseph was dead? Could there, 
Could there, the well there have been dug by Jacob as a place where he could go and remain in this place, this territory known as Joseph's plot to remain in times possibly when famine would come and when drought would come? Could this be the place that, that Jacob said, you know, I'm not leaving. I've lost my son, my, my son Joseph, the one that I love, the one that he gave the coat of many colors to. You see, you don't get to read about in that in your Bible because Joseph is where he's sold into slavery. He's living in the house of Potiphar. He is there making Potiphar rich. He is there being attacked by Potiphar's wife. He's being sold uh, into slavery literally in the dungeon of Egypt. Could it be that this is the place? We don't understand it. We don't know about this place because Joseph is off living the life of what it takes, amen, to become the fulfiller of God's dreams. Now, the dreams that Joseph received, we know that they came from God, right? They absolutely came from God. But for Joseph to realize and for everybody else to realize the dreams that God had for Joseph and that one day he would literally save the then known world by becoming second in command to Pharaoh himself, the king of Egypt. Could this be the place that Joseph comes? You see, we're receiving revelation and information here that nobody else knew about. But when Jesus came to town, he came to right a wrong. And even though it was part of the plan of God, amen, for Joseph to suffer the things that he suffered and to become uh, able to rise to the throne, to, to see many people say, I want you to know that there was still a wrong that needed to be righted. Praise God. Can you clap your hands to the Lord tonight? Now, whether this was actually the scenario or not, I believe, believe the included background. It's there in the word of the Lord revealed by Jesus is significant to us today. I believe Jesus was revealing a hidden piece of knowledge for all people. There are too many people that think nobody cares about the dilemma that they've lived through. And I have talked to many people, those that have been uh, assaulted by, by their own siblings, those that have been assaulted by their own father, their own mothers, and they are carrying scars about them that nobody else will ever know. I want you to know that Jesus cares. Many people carry burdens on their backs to where they think that nobody else cares, and it's not worth even telling anybody else because the pain is too great to share. There are too many people that, that don't think anyone cares about their pain. But I want you to know that although it may take a long time for God to reveal the story of your hurt uh, from Joseph down the thousands and hundreds of years, amen, that it took for Jesus to walk onto that spot, amen, and to set down on that well, I want you to know this, that Jesus will always right every wrong, that you're not going to live through an injustice that God will not make right praise God can you clap your hands to the Lord <laughs> hallelujah 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 I believe that God gave us this message tonight, and I want you to know that although it may take a long time for God to reveal the story of your hurt, He will go to the extreme lengths to make sure that you are not forgotten. I believe God, amen, is moving tonight, and that God knows, and that God is about to show up in this house tonight. You see, this was the ground that was given to Joseph that I'm talking about tonight. I believe that there are promises that God has set aside for each and every one of of us. Praise the Lord. There are promises that God has for you. Do you hear what I'm telling you tonight? It's not God's will for you to perish, but it's God's will, amen, that you inherit every eternal life. Praise God. you got to understand and believe that God's got a plan for your life. Amen. It's not God's will for you to be abused and then be left there to suffer with the consequences mentally. The, the physical may have passed away a long time ago and may have stopped the people bear in their minds the marks of, of abuse. I want you to know that God knows how to fix that. See, this was the ground given to Joseph. Think about all the time Joseph lived in slavery. 
Potiphar's house, in the Egyptian dungeon, and even in the palace. All he wanted was to be a part of his father's house. All he wanted was a place to settle down and to live out his dream. But the deception of his brothers deprived him of that peace and that place in the family plots. He deserved a spot. I said he deserved a spot. But it was never recorded, amen, in the courthouse. I want you to know that God will owe no man. You can be sure of this, that God will make sure that, every, that all justices, amen, are brought to pass. And that every sin will receive its just recompense of reward. If you don't believe that, you need to read the end of your Bible. If you think that some wickedness is forgotten and it's looked over because of who somebody is, I, I want to let you know it will not be. It doesn't matter if you wear a bag. Uh, if you are whatever you whatever place you might be a doctor you might be it doesn't matter whatever place God will make sure that every sin receives its just recompense of reward and I would encourage everyone that's been wrong and is protesting right now amen don't allow yourself to go into the looting and into the rioting stage because looting and rioting is not protest looting and rioting turns into sin amen and you know what too many people allow bitterness to get into their soul and pull them down until they even stoop lower than maybe what's been done wrong to them and maybe that's not a, a correct equal sign to put in there and I don't know if, if, if it can ever be equal but but here's what I will say. A person that's been done wrong to, you know what? There is no getting back. There is, it doesn't matter what you do to get back. You might kill somebody. You might murder them. You might beat their body into a pulp. But you know what? You will never feel like it's enough. You see, that's what sin does. It's never enough for sin. That's why forgiveness is more powerful, amen, than revenge. Revenge will carry you all the way to the end to where, where you will even harm yourself. But thanks be to God, amen, that we have a Savior, Jesus Christ, that took all the sin of the world and he carried it to an old rugged cross and he nailed it there, amen, so that we can live a life free, amen, of revenge free of regret, free of guilt. Oh, I don't know about what you're feeling tonight, but I want to let you know something. God knows where you are. God knows what you're going through. Hallelujah. God will know, oh, no man. If there are wrong that needs, that needs justice, God will attend to it. When Jesus said he must needs go through Samaria, that was the reason. He was on a journey to, wrong, to right a wrong done a long time ago. It just so happened that a poor Samaritan woman showed up out of season. All the servant girls had already been to the well to draw water. This woman came at an odd time to escape the ridicule of the crowds. The Bible said it was around noon, six hours into the day. She came out of season when everybody else was supposed to get water. Water, so nobody would know her story and reveal it to anyone else so that nobody would come along and ridicule her and say, okay, I know who you are. Yeah, you're that woman that hangs out, you know, in the red light district. I've got news for you, friend. People will do almost anything to escape the ridicule. If we, if, if we could, if any, everybody could see the skeletons that are in our closets, oh, how terrible would it be? We would not even want to walk out into the street from our home. We would want to live as a recluse and hermits amen, hiding because of what's been done to us in our lives. But I want to let you know something. God doesn't want you to live as a recluse and as a hermit, but God wants you, amen, to receive his love and his joy and to come out, amen, to be able to walk in the full light of day. Hey, listen to me. God knows where you're at and knows what's going through your life. See, we are all, we've all made mistakes. Many of us are just, many of us are just, waiting to be abused again. Even more have had their story stolen than their inheritance stolen like Joseph's. Think about all the years Jacob came to this well yearning for a son that had been taken from him, presumably dead. Think about the tears cried at this very spot. It was necessary for Jesus to come back. Sychar was a place of yearning. It's the place of if only, if only Joseph had lived. 
If only, and here come the regrets, if only I had not sent Joseph on that trip that day, my son would still be alive. So it's my fault. Self-blame begins to come in. If only Joseph had lived, if only the inconsolable heartache comes to us most of the time in the middle of the night. This is the place where Jesus came because he knew the aching of the heart. He knew the injustice that was done, but he come to make it right. Jesus knows where you are today, and the mission makes the difference. Not just to visit, that's not why he came, but he came to commemorate he may, came to make it right. I think it's important that we know the story of Jesus' return to Sychar. I believe this is a place where Jacob was when news came that Joseph was alive. He only left because he was going to meet his son Joseph that was dead but now is alive. The thrill that must have been in his heart to, to finally learn the news that Joseph is still alive and not just that but his dreams have come to pass hey listen to me friend there's it's within the heart of every father and mother hey man that they want to see their children uh, lifted up and they want to see them succeed they want to see them do better than they did in john the book of john jesus brought a gift with him the Bible said he asked her for a drink, and she told him that the Jews had no dealings with the Samaritans. Jesus didn't disagree. You know what? Sometimes you just can't disagree. Sometimes you just got to say, you know what? You're right, but I'm going to make it better. I'm going to do better. But he told her that he had something more satisfying than mourning about your past. Oh, we can sit and cry, and we can wonder, why did this happen to us all of our lives? Jesus doesn't come to just bring it out. He comes to heal it. He comes to heal. That, that's what repentance is about. We repent about things. We get baptized in Jesus' name, like Sister Debbie is going to do tonight. Why? Because the Bible says that we're, when we're baptized for the remission of our sins. In other words, those sins don't have their power in our lives anymore. The Bible says that we are literally buried with Him in baptism, that we become dead, amen, to all of the human things that would pull us down in this life. She goes on and she gets into a, a, a religious political debate. He asks her for a drink. And she looks at him and says, you know, you're a Jew. Why are you asking me of a drink? You see, these, the Samaritans that worshipped here, this was actually called Mount Gerizim. And Mount Gerizim was the mountain uh, situated, uh, and, and the comparison was made between this mountain and the mountain in Jerusalem. You can read the story there. It's in your text. You can read it. You can find out what they were talking about. And what she was really doing was bringing up a competitive nature of people even in religion. You can read it in your Bible. Some would brag and they would say, well, I'm of Paul, I'm of Apollos, I'm of this one. And, and they talked and they, they just compared about who baptized them. And when we start comparing and doing those things, bringing competition into the church, things don't work. Jesus dismissed the competition and said that the time is coming, and notice what he says, and now is when the true worshipers shall worship the Father in spirit and in truth. Here's the deal, friend. We can talk about our past all we want. We can moan and complain and, and, and about all the injustices that have been done for us, but Jesus came to this place that day to settle the issue because in the cross, Jesus settles the issue, and he says the bigger deal is not to complain and it's not to be competitive, but the bigger deal the higher order is to worship the Lord in spirit and in truth. I don't know about you tonight, but I came to worship the Lord. I didn't come to bellyache and to moan and to tell you all the things that have been done against me. I haven't come to you tonight to say, well, you know, when I was a little kid, you know, I was beat down. I, I haven't come to tell you about the story about my father when people attacked him when he was just a little boy and tried to get a bulldozer to bury him. You know what? Those things, those things don't matter anymore, but I, what does matter? 
matter is that my, my father found the Lord. He repented of his sins. He was baptized in Jesus' name, filled with the Holy Ghost. God got a hold of his life, and a little boy that came from the other side of the tracks, amen, was able to make something of himself. Amen. And I'm standing here tonight because God saved a little boy, amen, when he, was, when he was fighting for his life. I want you to know something tonight, that God will put his hand upon you. You're not here, amen, because of what's gone wrong in your life. You're here tonight because of what's gone right in your life. And you're serving a God that has protected you when you didn't even know you needed protecting. You've got a God that watches over you in the night when you don't even know you need a God to watch over you. You don't even know trouble is near you, but you've got a God that is there. And I know that there's all kinds of injustice that's going on in the world. I know, amen, the bitterness the centuries of bitterness that was, that was held by the Samaritan people, it can destroy one's life. You see, when all you ever do is complain, you're never part of the, the, the solution. All you ever are now is a part of the problem. If your children just listen to you complain about what's gone wrong in your life and how you have been abused, you know, then that's what they think life is normal about. But I, got, I want you to know something. Life is not about the things that go wrong in our life, but life is about the good things that can happen in our lives. I want my daughter to know, amen, that God can bless you to the uttermost. I want, I want this church to know that God can bless you, can give you the job, amen, that you really want all your life, and he can make all your dreams come true. I don't want you to sit around and complain and say, well, this went wrong, that went wrong, uh, this happened, and, and that person did this to me, and that's not what brings joy. But when you start talking about, hey, Jesus got a hold of my life. I've been forgiven of my sins. You see, because none of us, the Bible says that there is none that have not sinned, that we've all sinned and come short of the glory of God. And before I've got a right to complain about the injustices that have come to me and against me, I have first got to go and make the things that I have done wrong to other people. I've got to make them right. What's the equity in that if I complain only in what's been done wrong to me, but I don't ever make what's, what I have done wrong right? You see, that's what Jesus came to settle that day. He came with a mission. He came, amen, to destroy centuries of bitterness that destroy one's life. Let me say that in a few moments of bitterness can destroy a life. Amen. But I want you to know that the same few moments, and if you'll start worshiping in God and praising God for what he's doing in your life, you know what? Those same few moments can lift you up out of that primordial ooze and, and bring you up out of the of the sludge of life and the hurt and the bitterness that so many people want to embrace it can bring us up and say you know what there can be a new day what if what if someone and i have seen a few of these police officers that have joined together with those that are marching and saying you know what that what that guy did was not right and i'm going to march with you let me just say this here today if we would all grab a hold of the things of god and join hands together and begin to love the lord and let the world know you know that injustice is wrong but here's the other thing that we've got to understand that man and those people that did those things do we doom them to hell forever to doom to someone forever to hell, if not, it's just as bad, if not worse than what that man did to George Floyd. You see, that's what bitterness does. It doesn't stop at, at, at an equal sign. It goes farther. It goes farther and farther. And here's the deal. Revenge is never enough. That's why you've got to turn it over to God. Turn it over to a God that knows how to weigh it equitably a God that says you know what it has been met but here's the thing that we got to understand that all sin ends up at Calvary Jesus came and said worship is not about a place but it's about a person it's about the Lord Jesus Christ he revealed to her who he was and she left not with bitterness in her heart but she left a woman that had been afraid to a woman that now went out as a as a clarion call and as an announcer to to her world and say come see a man that told me everything that I ever did in other words she was saying this y'all know who I am y'all know what I've done you know all know that I'm a prostitute y'all know that I have done some very wicked and evil things and I have hid behind that and I 
I have slinked in the shadows, but not anymore because I met the Messiah. I met the King of Kings. I met the Lord of Lords. I met the one that can read my mail. Amen. He knows every intimate secret of my heart. He knows every bone of the, every skeleton in my closet. That's the God that showed up that day. The God that showed up to say, you know what? I know you ended up in this situation through no fault of your own. And yes, you might be suffering as a prostitute, but I want you to know I've got a better plan for your life. I've got a better plan. Oh, hallelujah. And so she left him to go tell everyone that the Messiah was in town. She didn't hold it to herself and say, you know what? I kept my bitterness to myself and I hid with her, so I'll keep my Jesus to myself and I'll hide with him. No, she said, I've got to tell everybody. She ran through the streets of the city going and saying, hey, listen, you remember me? I'm not the same woman I used to be. God got a hold of me and he's made everything right in my heart. Jesus has come to her town. Jesus had come to their situation. Jesus had come to their dilemma. I want you to know that Jesus has come to your situation. Jesus has come to your dilemma. He's come to your predicament. And everyone came because of what a despondent woman declared. The confession that she made. Come see a man that told me everything. The bigger thing is that she was okay talking about it now. I want you to know that Jesus has come not just to expose your heart. You ever see people that when you get a, when you get a bad boo-boo, a boo-boo, maybe you fall down and you cut your hand or maybe you have a surgery and you notice this with, with guys, mostly guys, not gals, but they come together and they want to compare their scars. They want to compare their boo-boos. Yeah, well, I had a boo-boo, and, and it was this long. Somebody else comes along and says, well, I had a boo-boo that was that long. Or I had one that was that long. Or maybe they'll pull up and there's a limb missing. It's not about comparing the size of our boo-boos. It's not just talking about it. That's not what the Lord does. But the Lord will come into your life, and he'll heal you. He'll make it. And even in one place, if you read, the Bible was talking about um, some lepers. And in one place in the Bible, the Bible says that they came and they called out to Jesus and they said, Jesus, the son of David, have mercy on us. And Jesus healed them. And the Bible says this, that there was ten of them. And one of them turned around and went back to thank him. And when he thanked him, Jesus looked at him and said, go your way. You are made whole. And when you look up that word whole, the word whole does not mean full of scars. But it means that where noses had rotted off before, they grew back. And it was just as fresh as a baby's skin. Fingers that had been gnarled and hands that were, that were consumed by flesh-eating bacteria and and. and all kinds of, all of a sudden fingers started growing back. Stumps started growing back. And the body was made whole. I'm here to tell somebody that God just doesn't want to give you scars in your spirit. But God wants to heal your heart. So that when you hear the story now, you say, yeah, that happened to me. But you know what? I don't feel its consequences anymore. Because Jesus set me free. Jesus healed me. I don't talk about that with anger in my heart anymore. But I realize that Jesus did something for me that the psychologist can't do. The psychiatrist can't do. You may even find a brain surgeon that can go in and numb and, and take out parts of your life. But you know what? Jesus can go in and take it without ever invading your body. Oh, hallelujah. I don't know if you understand what I'm talking to you about tonight, but if you could talk to Jacob, if you could talk to Joseph, and you could understand what was stolen between that son and his father, then you would understand. To those of you that have lost a child, I've never done that. But maybe that is the closest thing that you can ever come to. The longing that's in your heart, and I don't mean to bring 
I don't mean to bring feelings into your life right now and tears to your eyes about the loss that you suffered, but here's, here's what I want to say to you, that God can heal the hurt. But it's the mission that makes a difference. Because as Jesus came to right that wrong that was done so long ago, he came to heal a woman. He did. He come and gave her a new life. You see, that's what the gospel's all about. It's about taking our old life, the old me, the hurt me, the bitter me, the one that, that hangs on to unforgiveness and say, no, friend, I'm sorry. It hurt too much. Jesus comes into our life. And he can't becomes more than enough. Hallelujah. As the musicians come tonight. I don't know where you're at in life. I don't know what problems you've had. I don't know how you've been abused. There's not a doubt in my mind that every one of us has been damaged at some point in our lives. We've all reacted and said things that at the moment we meant, but later on we regretted. Done things. Issued hurt into people's lives. Caused them to cry. I hurt, therefore I hurt others. The cycle just keeps going on. And on and on. And since the fall in the garden with all the blaming that took place until today, the blaming still continues. But I'll tell you this. It can all stop at the foot of Calvary. Friend, if you're here tonight and, and you're tired of being despondent, you're tired of Carrying all that weight. Bitterness is heavy. Carrying wrong and injustices. Well, that's a terrible thing to have to carry. There's not a handle that's comfortable enough. There's not a mind, a psyche strong enough to bear that every hour of every day, every minute, every second. No wonder so many people commit suicide in the middle of the night. It's because it's in those times when people can't sleep. sleep sleeplessness comes upon them. Their mind is tormented, not just by what's been done to them, but what they've done to other people. But I want you to know that in one little trip to Samaria, Jesus saved an entire nation. Could it be that there's more at stake tonight than just your life and your soul. But I'll tell you what's really at stake tonight. It's not just who you are. But it's about your family. It's about your mom, your dad, your grandmas, your grandpas, your uncles, your aunts, your nieces, and your nephews. I had a preacher friend one time, and I even hate to share this story with you. But he had been hurt. Another preacher had come to town and had come in and stirred up a bunch of trouble and taken, virtually took over, took 100 people, 75 people out of his church in one service. One day they had a nice service. The next Sunday they came and over half the church was gone. And this preacher let it bother him so much 
I was a young preacher, and I was just trying to learn. But every time I got together with him, all he wanted to talk about was this other man that had hurt him. So instead of teach, being able to teach me good things, all I got to hear was the negative talk. I pray for that man today. I pray for both of them. I pray that somehow God would send peace. I preach too long. I know that. But I feel that there's somebody listening tonight. You've been battling. You've been doing the best you can just to get by. But I want you to know that tonight Jesus can make it all better. He can right the wrongs. He can save your life. And all you got to do is ask him to forgive you. That doesn't make sense, preacher. How do I ask God to forgive me and he comes in my life? Here's the deal. It's about positioning Christ. If you'd like to stand with me tonight, I won't be much longer. I'm excited to baptize Sister Debbie. But here's what happens. You go from being in position to where you have been a sinner, an offender, to where all of a sudden now God says, you know what? I forgive you. And when he forgives you, he restores you. Back to your original. Just as if, listen to this, we always want to point it towards sin and what we did. He restores us to just as if we had never sinned. But I want to let you know, it's deeper than that. When God comes in your life and you give him authority and you give him the rulership in your, in your life, you know what? It's not only just he makes it as if you had never sinned. Listen, are you ready? He makes it as if you had never been sinned against. You had never been offended. You had never been abused. I don't think we've ever caught that before. I know I haven't. But that's what God can do in our life. So as we pray tonight, I want to encourage you to let go. If you're hanging on to past abuses and past bitterness, won't you let it go tonight? Can we pray right now? Some of us had some pretty diabolical things done to us. But I'm telling you, at the foot of Calvary, every high place is brought down and every low place is brought up. Doesn't matter what your name is, doesn't matter what your color is, but at the foot of Calvary, it's all level ground. What you lived through, you didn't deserve. Joseph, you didn't deserve that. You were the favorite of God. Oh, Holy Ghost, sweep in this room right now. Oh, Holy Ghost, sweep across the web, Lord, right now. God, I pray, Lord, that you would heal hearts, Jesus. I know you're on a mission tonight to heal hearts. Go, those that have been abused, those that have been hurt, Lord, I pray, God. Heal their souls. Heal their spirits, Lord. I can't heal you. There's not a doctor in this world that can heal you. But Jesus can. Just one trip. As the singers begin to sing, won't you worship the Lord right now? I'd like to open the altar up if you'd like to come up around the front and pray. 
I want you to know God will never let you down. Family might let you down. Friends might let you down. But Jesus will never let you down. I might let you down. Your mom might let you down. Your dad might let you down. But Jesus will never let you down. I died over 25 years ago. There's not one thing I can do about that. But here's what I know. Jesus can heal our hearts and he has become my father. And he'll become your father. Oh, Jesus, right now, God. God will make it right. You hear me? God will make it right. Jesus in your name, Lord. 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 Oh, Lord. Oh, Lord. Oh, Lord. Oh, Lord.
you what a delight it is to be here tonight and to share in this great, great event. And uh, sin's washed away, Sister Debbie. Sin's washed away. New nature. That's what I talked about tonight. And I'm so thankful. In the years that we've known you, you've just been such a blessing and such a wonderful, wonderful person. And we're so thankful tonight for all that God has done in your life. And this is very a, a very touching moment for me. And I believe it is for you as well. And your family is so beautiful and we, we just love them and we're thankful. We're thankful. We're going to pray right now. Let's pray for Sister Debbie. God, we, we thank you, Lord, for what you've done. We're asking you to touch Sister Debbie right now in the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. And God, I'm praying, Lord, that you would be upon her, Lord, and that you would bless her all the days of her life, God, and, and that your spirit would do its entire work, Lord, in her heart and in her soul, Lord. God, we pray, Lord, that you would multiply this work. We're so thankful. So thankful, Lord. We bless in Jesus' name. Sister Debbie Benedict, upon the confession of your faith and seeing that you have received the Holy Ghost speaking in another language, it's now my privilege and honor to baptize you in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins in Jesus' name.